All right. So we pick up the dorm uh, counselor thing at LSU with Liz. I remember last time. She said she was dating a doctor or a med school student. Uh, I think he went to a different school, or maybe he was in. I know the dental school was in New Orleans. Maybe the med school was in New Orleans too. I don't know. He didn't live in Baton Rouge. So. All right. So. Right. So, counselor, camp counselor with Liz. Then I lived in the State Street apartment. It was like a. It walked in. It was the first one on the bottom right. I don't remember the number. It was. I think it was maybe one or ten or something. I don't know. So bottom right, you walked into the bedroom, and then it was like a little kitchen, living area, and a bathroom. Um, that, someone stole my moped from there. It's a uh, 1974 Vespa moped, like royalish, darkish bluish Vespa blue. Um, I bought it in a, at a like a one of those flea market uh, things they have, just random like group of people. And they have a field, and they each have a little booth. Uh, it was in the Houston area, uh, excuse me, DFW area where Mark's family lived. And it was like $150, I think. My check, my money. I, I, I presume Mark stole it, but I never knew. <sighs> I used to lug it in the apartment, so I guess someone was in the apartment and had a key or whatever. Bobby McKee gave him a key. Who knows? Um, so, and I got a bicycle. It was pink, but it was the cheapest one they had. It was a mountain bike. That was $350, by the way, that I saw in Athens. Did you keep it in a freaking warehouse or something? Um, and what else happened at State Street? Uh, I, don't know. I still worked at Calendar's Cafe on Highland. So people would, oh, I, was, I went to bed one night. The, the one time I forget to lock my door, the front door. I just, I just had gone to bed. And someone lets themselves in, lets themselves, some guy lets himself in. Because I heard someone tell this guy he, he could use her restroom. And I'm expecting, it sounded like the, the neighbors upstairs and to the left. But um, he goes to my apartment. And I'm sitting there peeking. I don't have my contacts. I don't think I had contacts at the time or they weren't in. And, or, and I didn't have my glasses on. So I'm watching him, he goes to the restroom, flushes, and then walks out. And then he notices I'm like awake, I guess. And he said, sorry, I thought, or something, I just had to use, I don't know what he said. And I said, that's all right, just close the door. And he said, you might want to lock, so I usually do lock it. So you're right, I'll lock the door. So he, he went out and I locked the door. So I guess whoever that was used my apartment as well, as her apartment or their apartment or whatever, I don't know. Uh, pretty much just I rarely ate there I, because I worked in a restaurant. I just ate in the restaurant. It was free or cheap. Uh, bathed there and slept there. That's it. Get my clothes there. My stuff there. Um, it was, let's see, somebody was always clogging the toilet, but it smelled like septic. So I poured some septic stuff in there and it went away. So I guess that was just a septic tank. And, and then I got the 626, the Mazda 626. And... I guess I about that one. Then after that one, I guess I moved back in with Mark Dixon for a little bit there. Uh, and then I moved to the Dean Lee. I rented a house on Dean Lee. Oh, yeah, that's when Mark bought his gun back. He called me and um, he asked if, I, if he could buy the gun back, the uh, Russian Makarov, just below a 9mm. And I said, sure, why not? I just actually didn't even remember that I had it, so I looked in my closet, I was like, yep, I have it, and there you go. And then the bank calls me and says something like, he said you stole a check or something, and I was like, uh, nope, didn't steal a check, he called me, I didn't even call him, I didn't even remember I had the gun. He wanted the gun back. I'm like, oh. um, then, that's when I saw, okay, so I didn't even have cable. I don't know how this old-ass TV got in my, it was in the State Street apartment, all of a sudden. I didn't bring it there. Or actually, it was in the was it in State Street? State Street. 
No, it was in the the loft department. Okay, so I did bring it to the loft because it was with the Nadine Lee. Someone brought me this old TV that was ours growing up. It's like one of those knobby TVs. I didn't have cable. I barely watched TV ever. So I'm sitting there with my dog and I come home and somebody had strewn all my, I used to sew basic sewing, make these dresses just because why not? I, I was trying to keep myself occupied. Uh, tore the patterns up and strew them all over the apartment. And I walk in and I'm going, great. What the hell? And poor, poor little scribbles just sitting there in his bed, looking at me going, are you going to blame me for this? It, it obviously wasn't him. So I pretend, pretend beat him. The TV turns on that was unplugged, mind you. It was unplugged. I don't have cable, and it was unplugged. And there's Oprah Winfrey, the fat fucking whore, saying, don't you blah, blah, blah that dog. And I'm looking at her thinking, and I check, and yep, it's still unplugged. So how is she on my TV if it's unplugged and I don't have cable? I don't know. So I look down at Scribbles, I'm like, oh, Scribble, are you hungry? Let's go get some food. So we go get some food. Uh-uh. You're fucking crazy, Oprah. You are fucking crazy. There's no dog slobber on the patterns. It wasn't my fucking dog. You fucking whore. So I move out of that apartment. The, the people that own the house or manage the apartment or the house rental asked me if I had problems with ghosts and doors opening and stuff. And I was like, uh, no. no, I don't. That was weird. So I, I moved back with the parents for a little while before I go to Disney Orlando for the college program. It's like a three month program. And I was, I worked at the electric umbrella. It was like half janitor, half whatever food girl behind the counter. Uh, my roommates, they set you up with an apartment. They give you puny pay, but you can go to the parks whenever you want to off the, when you're not working. And they give you free transportation to all the parks. Um, so the, the girl that shared my room was Stephanie. She's like strawberry blonde. Um, Leah, I think she had a roommate to begin with, or she didn't have a roommate, and I, I can't remember if, I know one girl uh, changed apartments, maybe that was her roommate, and she just never got another one. Anyway, Leah had her own roommate, uh, her own room, and then Jill and Jennifer shared another room. So Jill and Jennifer are dark brown. Uh, Leah was like that sandy, light brown, dark blonde color, and then Stephanie's, uh, what, strawberry blonde. She met a guy named Nick there, and they dated, I think, for a little while, and she ended up saying in his whatever. I guess he didn't have a roommate either. Uh, there was a big to-do because Jill was freaking out because she lost a movie or someone stole a movie or something. But she already invited everyone over and said loud and clear, just you can take the movies, just let someone know that you have them and just bring them back. Well, somebody came and asked for the movie and I was like, well, she's not here. She said just take them, so I'll just let her know you borrowed blah, blah, blah movie. Well, she didn't ask anyone. She just called the police, apparently, or she didn't ask me. So the police came by, and I had to write out this statement down, and I'm like, there you go. She just had to ask me, or just ask anyone, but she didn't. So whatever, Jill. Whatever. So I meet this guy, Hurley. I think he worked at the Electro Umbrella for a little while. He keeps asking me. This one had crappy hair. So when I broke up with Mark, I, I cut it off, just and it was really cute, except people kept asking me if I was gay, and I'm like, I'm not gay. My hair's just short. That's it. Just short hair. I saw there was a girl in one of my in my surveying class that had short hair, and I was like, it looks cute. And she said people kept asking her if she was gay, and I'm like, well, you don't look gay to me. And I didn't think anything of it, but then I kept it in the back of my mind. I said, maybe I just do something. So I got something similar. I didn't dye it at first, but it's freaking expensive. You, I actually can get it cut every two weeks to keep it looking decent because it grows out so fast. So I decided I better not have that haircut anymore. Besides, I got tired of people asking me if I was gay. <sighs> So I let it grow out, except right before I let it grow out, I dyed it, I got it white, except it turned orange. And I was like, uh, are you going to leave it like that? And he said, nope, I've never seen that before in my life. I like, me either. I had never remembered getting it white again. So he, he makes it white. It looks like shit. I hate it. But I said, I hate it. But this is what I asked for. I have to deal with it. So I let it grow out. And then I dye it like this sort of reddish color. It's obviously dyed red. It's obviously crappy growing out from the hair. So I go through Disney through this crappy hairstyle, 
and um, work at the electric umbrella, meet this guy named Hurley. He's really sweet, but he keeps asking me what color my eyes are. I'm like, they're blue. He doesn't believe me, apparently, but I have like these light, it's this ever so slightly light green uh, contacts. And so finally I say, they're green. Do you believe me, they're green? And he said, they're green. And I'm like, they're blue. They are freaking blue. As far as I know, I, and I don't remember about the light brown I saw when, um, let me go, let me just take a little, uh, what's it called? Non sequitur. Back to Slidell, little tweeny dinky pot mark. So Mark Goodson is, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend with Julie Daly. And I'm Mark, you know, Mark Goodson's little sister, tweeny, teeny pot narc for pot. Nobody gives a shit about pot. So we're, they take me to this house and they're whatevering. And I'm the little sister, supposedly bratty little sister, having to hang out with the other little sisters and brothers because Mark's mom won't leave, let him leave me at home, at home alone. I'm hanging out there and he threatens to leave me there and, and not take me home. And I'm like, dude, I, I guess I got angry because my eyes went light brown. And uh, somebody said something and I, was, and I was like, they're not. Or maybe I went to the bathroom. I don't remember how it started. But I ended up in the bathroom. My eyes were light brown. And I was freaking out. What the hell did you give me? Did you drug me? I'm telling mom. I'm telling mom. Because I got to stay in this fucked up whatever world we're in. And he's freaking out going, uh, I was like, you better not leave me here, Marcuson. I'm telling mom. <sighs> what the fuck did you give me? Why are my eyes light brown? Freaking out. And then I washed my hands. Apparently the water was really hot. And they go blue again. Right in front of my eyes. I'm going, wow, that was weird. So I go out and they're blue again. And I'm like, you better call mom and tell her to keep me here now. Or just take my ass home right now. Threaten to leave me here again. Don't leave this fucking house. Dude, I was so mad. So then I told, you know, whoever at Slidell Police Department, I was like, my eyes went light brown. Could you test me for something? I don't know what they did, they did to me, but I washed my hands and, and the water was hot, I guess. And it went away. All right, maybe I... I don't remember what happened. Anyway, nothing. No drugs, no nothing. So they're like, oh, I don't know what happened to you, girl. But Mark said the same thing. He said, uh, they were light brown. I am not crazy. I didn't, mm -mm. I don't have light brown contacts ever. So that was the first time that I remember seeing my eyes go different colors. All right, so fast forward back to, you know, Twinny Potnark. So he takes me home. I mean, excuse me. What was it? Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, Hurley. So he kept asking me about my eye color, and I'm like, I, they're blue as far as I know. But I had teeny, like, the, it's like the slightest little color of green in my contacts. I didn't want to go any green at that. So he took me dancing one night, and that was it. That was it. I can't do this anymore. It wasn't even, oh, it was fun, but nobody was dancing. They were all dancing, like, rigid and formal. And I was just like, what? Okay. So I don't remember how the hell I got back from Florida. I was supposed to take a flight back. But I think Jill, I know, I remember Jill said she would take me back in the car. For some reason, I don't remember that car ride. I don't know. What happened there? So I ended up moving into the Bay St. Louis house that Tita owns because they're divorced now, I think. And Tita, I guess this was before they moved to um, Virginia. So it's a little house, Valentine Street, Bay St. Louis, not too far from the beach. Uh, it is uh, three bedrooms, one bath, I think. And they were supposedly, you know, updating it. It looks like shit. Uh, so there's a, a fence backyard, but there's no gate in the fence. And the laundry is in the, in the there's a little shed in the back of the house. So it's kind of creepy. So you can't really get out of the property from the back door. You have to go out the front door. Unless you want to climb a fence, a chain link fence. And it's, it's not like a, a four foot or a six foot. I think it was even, it might have been eight feet. It was definitely at least six feet. So I, uh, I think I went to the pound and got a dog. I said a stray dog or something, or no one claimed her. Sandy, I named her, because she, she liked the beach. I just named her Sandy. Um, she was a sweet dog. Fortunately, I mean, I worked all the time, though, so she had to stay. I took her out whenever I could. We went to the beach whenever we could. I kept her in the house. Let's not keep her in the backyard because it's so fucking hot. So I would work in Bay St. Louis. Uh, excuse me. I would work in Biloxi, Landry's Seafood House in Biloxi. Uh, live in Bay St. Louis. It was the only job I could find. 
I searched all around Bay St. Louis. I wasn't about to work in uh, Baton Rouge when I lived in Bay St. Louis. So the closest job I could find was Biloxi. Then Bay St. Louis, go to LSU. Complete opposite directions of the world. <sighs> so I make it, I think I just was that one semester and I said, well, maybe I should stop driving. I gotta move back to Baton Rouge. So I moved back to Baton Rouge. Uh, the Landry's crew and I went out uh, in New Orleans one night. That was fun. I got to dance. It was so I love dancing. But this weird dark haired looked like a kid. It was the gay bar. I was dancing on a table because I, I don't think I look gay. Or a bar or a little island thing. Someone said, why don't you get on there and dance? And I was like, okay. I'll dance on the table. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I didn't even have any drink yet. So dancing away, and this little high school looking kid, or younger even, comes up to me and says, I love you. And I'm going, dude, you don't love me. Who are you? Where's your mother? <laughs> so nobody else wants to dance. I don't understand. So we to go to some other bar, wander around the area. So he starts to follow me, and I was like, dude, you gotta stop following me. The little dark haired guy from the bar. But I'm like, yeah, you don't love me. I don't know who that is. I don't love him. Anyway. So that was fun. Except that was the, well, would you believe I got a flat tire on the side of the interstate and I can't come to work tonight and neither of the rest of the crew. <laughs> that was kind of like, I can't do this shit anymore. I gotta go back to my nurse. So, uh, and I can't give anyone else a ride home either, sorry. They were gonna stay anyway, so why? Just took my little time home. All right, so then I, I got a job at Classic Bride, I guess. I think, I don't remember where I worked. I lived in the loft apartment then, I, I think which was like, it's just a, a room, sort of like a living room area, and then a little kitchen area. I don't know the pantry here. And the stairs go up and there's a bedroom and bathroom. So I liked it. You know, I saw this movie a long time ago on uh, FX. It had the really nice idea of uh, using uh, Ivy as sort of like a, a visual barrier. So you could see over the balcony and there was this huge like window where people could see in your bedroom if they wanted to, I guess, which kind of creeped me out. So I, I hung up all these ivies with the heart-shaped leaves and you couldn't really see. I mean, it's not like 100% opaque, but I thought it was pretty. Anyway, I got to use that idea finally. I was so excited. The LSU uh, Architecture School did that in their uh, main building. It's uh, sort of like the, I guess it's like the Guggenheim where it's circular and then you've got you know, the different floors, but they put the little plants in. Okay, so back to the loft. So I guess I worked at Classic Bride then. I don't really know where I worked, which is really weird. I don't think I worked at Classic Bride then. Maybe, anyway. Maybe I still worked at Calendars? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, so Robert, whatever his name was, met him. Monty is when I, I met him online. So I went online to this dating thing, and it was like, one guy was like, corn is so cool, huh? Corn, 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 corn. And I was like, there's something wrong with you. That's all he could talk about was corn. K-O-R-N, band. I don't think I've ever heard of it yet. So then, and then I guess the other one was Monty. <sighs> and that's when I, uh, you know, met Big Buckle Rapist. I was sitting down on the sidewalk waiting for Monty because I didn't want him to know where I lived. You know, supposedly he didn't know where I lived. And Big Buckle Rapist shows up. And I was like, dude, that's not Monty. <laughs> he's got a big fucking buckle. It's like a country western buckle. And he's freaking huge. All right. So then I guess, what is this, random? All right, I sort of move into this house as a rent the room with some woman that owns a bunch of chows. I was gonna stay there, but then Monty just said, why don't you just come live with my mother? Okay. So I stay with Pat Johnson in her apartment, and I guess it's, it's at least a two bedroom, maybe three, I don't know. I had one of the bedrooms. It didn't have an adjoining bathroom, I shared a bathroom. But again, I wasn't really that, there that often. It was kind of like sleep and bathe. And I guess I would eat whenever Pat and Biden. And uh, I think it was Dana and someone else were uh, Monty's mother's like friends or something. I don't know. Dana ended up getting pregnant, and 
uh, didn't, I don't know, she didn't want to stay with her boyfriend or something, she didn't trust him, wasn't good to her, I don't know what it was. All right, so <coughs> I ended up graduating civil engineering May 2000. Uh-huh, oh yeah, so somewhere in there I got the Buick LeSabre, the big blue car, four-door, huge monster car. Um... Monty lived on uh, Quorum, I think Quorum Street or something. At the time, when he didn't live with Dan, but that's when he said he had this HR business, and Dan was his partner, Dan East, Eastman or Eastland or something like that. And we got invited to, Dan invited us to his apartment with his girlfriend uh, for dinner. So his girlfriend had a son, at seven, eight, nine-ish, who... I was sitting in the living room and they were watching TV, but then I remember hearing Dan tell, I guess me or the kid's mom, the kid was sitting right there. He said he got the kid a, a Victoria's Secret subscription so he could, whatever, like a junior Playboy magazine. And I was just like, well, Monty's in the kitchen. The mom is right there. I, I didn't know what to do. I was like, well, uh, that's fucking sick. So I, he was already following me around. I, I didn't know what to do. Anyway, I didn't report it right away, obviously. But the mom was right there and she can't possibly think that's acceptable. So I don't know if they ever got married or still together or what happened there. So Monty decides to show up in Bay St. Louis um, blocks the exit and says, why don't we get married? And I'm going, motherfucker. So I didn't really what to do either. So I said, sure, why not? So we, I said, why don't we, um, he says, do you want something about a big wedding? And I'm going, uh-uh. <laughs> no. So I get some cheap-ass white-ish dress on the cell rack from some department store, and we go to Miami Dade and get married and drive back. Stop at some like Outback or Longhorn or something. And I'm just going, I just really wish this dude would go away. So forever move in, Bonnie buys his house. Uh, he said the lady died. It was an older lady that lived by herself and she died. I'm supposed to clean it up. So I start trying to clean it up, but it's just overwhelming, and I start small, and then he's expecting me to make him dinner, and I don't even know what the hell he likes to eat. He likes, like, greasy spoon, country d food. Plus, I have a job. I get a job. Well, actually, I get a job at uh, Lion's Off, I think it was called. It's a company in Snellville, or it was a company in Snellville. They do, like, uh, transmission lines, electric, ele electricity transmission lines design. So I think I'm there a week or two after Monty and I and thinking, I guess I gotta go back to Prairie Bill. But the funny thing is, he took us, one of the like top guys, owners or something, he took us to uh, the Harley Davidson dealership in Snellville. I don't know why he took us there. He said, we're going on a field trip, let's go girls. Hired three women, one secretary or receptionist or whatever, and two engineers, females. So we go there and um, look around at the Harleys. Oh, those are Harleys. So we get back to the office, I think, or somewhere along the line, he tells us his joke. <laughs> so fucking funny. He says something like, his wife was complaining that he was riding his Harley too much. So he says, without even thinking, without his filter on, he says, if you were as much fun to ride as my Harley, maybe I'd ride you more often too. Oh my fucking God. <laughs> I can't believe he said that. He said that really happened. I'm like, I'm sorry. Are you still married? <laughs> so then I really decide I have to go back and divorce money and uh, go back to Prairieville. So I go back to Prairieville. Of course, you can't leave and run away. I get a job. I have to have a job first. So I work environmental management services. They're based out of Hattiesburg, Mississippi. They have office in Baton Rouge. And apparently there was one in El Dorado that I didn't know about. So I work... I don't know how long for bat in Baton Rouge, and then I literally just one day decided 
just to go to the police and be like, I don't know what's wrong with me. He scares me. I don't want to be married anymore. He has this medication in the cabinet. I think he's giving it to me. So can you, I don't know what to do. He says, they said, do you want us to go with you to get your stuff? I said, okay. So I pack my stuff up and just leave. Um, meantime, EMS says I can go, uh, I, Kirk Lowry uh, was one of the people in the Baton Rouge office. He was a geotechnical engineer. He said he was supposed to go to El Dorado for this job for six months, but why don't I go instead? I'm like, oh, okay, sure, why not? So, but they said, take, their, take your time getting there. And I'm like, why do you want me to take my time getting there? So I drive up, whatever, I stay one night at this bed and breakfast and get there. I'm there for about six months, I think. And first they had me in a hotel, but then I feel like I'm spending too much money. I think the hotel's gotta be horrendously expensive. I can't cook anything, so I have to eat out all the time. And um, so I, they had apartments there. I was like, why don't I just move into an apartment? I can cook and whatever. So I move into the apartment and the money shows up. I'm like going, great. I didn't call him. He calls me and except so I move into the apartment and I think he said for some reason he was with me when I bought the furniture for the apartment but he said Clyde said I could get whatever I wanted and I'm going I don't know why you think I'm gonna trust you with that but I got a, a little love seat and I think I got a bed frame and a mattress but I don't even think I expensed it I don't remember how I paid for it I must have, I may have put it on my credit card but I don't remember anyway so I'm in the apartment, and the dude on the, if you're looking out the door on the left side, has this tinfoil on his windows. Someone told me along the lines that uh, people who do drugs or make drugs put that shit on the window so no one can see in the apartment what's going on. So I'm like, great. I got some nefarious thing going on here. I got the dude on the right-hand side underneath me who named his dog Tara. So every time he calls his fucking dog, I'm like, is somebody calling my name? What the hell's going on? <sighs> So I call the police about, because then eventually this little youngish looking female is sitting with all these men outside eating on the balcony of the nefarious apartment side. And he says, hey, this is my niece. And I'm looking around going, all these men, well, she doesn't look like a niece to me. So I call the police and I'm like, look, I don't know what's going on here. I explain about the, the temple in the windows. I explain about the youngish looking girl with all these men. I don't know what's going on, but maybe you could go check it out for me. Then I decide maybe it's time to swing by the little well, I was just walking down downtown El Dorado and I saw the DA's office. So I'm like, I pop in and I, uh, there's a receptionist or, or legal secretary or something right there or whatever. And I say, excuse me, uh, my ex-husband's here. I don't know why he's here. He scares me. Uh, do you think you could, I don't know, figure out why he's here or something? She asked my driver's license. So I give her my driver's license and, but, uh, I think she asked for my name also, so I said it out loud, Tara Seabolt Thrash, I think was my legal name at the time. So out from this office pops Monty, and I'm going, oh, wow, there he is. I'm leaving. I take my little driver's license, and I, I leave. So then that started the, like, um, everyone on the construction site said, Tara, you need to run for your life. And I'm going, why the hell would I need to run for my life? I don't understand what you're talking about. So I go to the track, thinking maybe they think, because I'm smoking a lot, because I, apparently I think someone was putting an allergen in the air. So I start smoking a lot. I, um, I, I'm desperately needing salt. I forget my lunch. It's just going bad on the construction site. But I can't leave until it's done. So I, I'm like, maybe they're trying to tell me I need to be healthier. So I go to the track, and there's Duncan, Pam and Blaine's friend, running around the track, and he is one big-ass dude. So I'm thinking, he's trying, he's definitely watching me. He's trying to get closer to me. And I'm not in the mood to outrun that motherfucker. So I said, well, yes, I'm going to run later. So I leave. Um, apparently, that's not what they're talking about. So I ended up just leaving Nashville to, I don't even know where, to back to El Dorado to get my shit. Only, I don't know what, where to go. I don't want to move in with Aaron. I don't, so if for some reason Aaron calls me and says, why not, or I might call her or something, and why don't you move in with me? So I'm like, fine, I'll move with you. Sean gives me like $250, and I just pack as much stuff in my thing, and I leave. But I know I packed my, the quilt that Tita made me, and some other things that disappeared. And reappeared, 
at Hopchase, and then disappeared. I haven't seen him since. So I go to Atlanta, move in with, Aaron was living in a house with Laura Peterson, Aaron Katrina Seabolt at the time. And she's really weird. She sets out dinner and says, I'm gonna make dinner, this is what's gonna be, okay. Why don't you make dinner? Well, you said you were gonna make it, and do you want me to make it? Why don't you just say, can you make dinner tonight, Tara? Why don't you just say, I, I don't know, anything. So anyway, I'm looking for a job. I get a job at Chili's Toco Hills, a server. Um, and then Aaron and I move into the Blue Ridge Apartments. So I think we were in the Blue Ridge Apartments when Aaron decides she wants to go to Savannah, Georgia for, I don't know, I guess it was, maybe it was Patty's Day or something. But Angela Schrieffer is with us. That uh, she said died of uh, ovarian cancer or something. I don't remember what she said she died of. But, so Angie's with us. We go to Savannah and there's Yeshua Williams. Oh, dear fucking God. She said, Tara, look who I found. Oh, Yeshua. Nice. He said it was in the army. <sighs> he got me this blue shirt. Anyway, we go back to Atlanta. Working, working, working. Uh... I had the borrowed car. I just went to work. Or I had the, um, the, the red car. The Grand Prix or Brandy. I wish I didn't know what that red car was. Oh, yeah. That's right. I ended up getting it registered finally. <laughs> okay. So then I'm, David's there. David starts to work at Toko Hills. Um, wait, but he lives in Brookhaven with his you know sister, Wendy. It's like one of those roommate plans. David's the first one on the, if you're walking in on the left, Wendy's on the right. And I find out that I'm pregnant, except it should be David's kid, but I tell Erin and she said, well, it could be Yeshua's too. And I'm like, well, it, hmm. okay. So anyway, I call, well, actually I didn't even tell Tita. I told Erin because she's my roommate. I figured she'd find it anyway. But Tita calls. Well, I hope you've gotten your life straightened out, Tara. I, just, I said, Erin, you want to talk to him? You know, mom. <laughs> so I'm working at Chili's, pregnant. I get a job at ATC Associates in the meantime. Still working two jobs. Two jobs. And I have to tell David, well, Erin said she thinks it might be Yeshua's baby. So we don't get married until baby's born. After baby's born. So baby's born. Uh, May 25, 2003. David and I don't get married until November 03. Because I still think it's David, he's David's kid, so I don't know. But the thing is, um, so my water broke at the Brook, Brookhaven apartment. I didn't know it was water breaking. I had to pee. I thought it sounded different, but I didn't know, like I'm supposed to know. So then, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm on the, the clock with the contractions, it's so regular, and I'm like, dude, it's gotta be labor. Two days in labor. They, they say, well, we better go to the, the office. So we go to the OBGYN's office on one way, and it looks like Rashid is the OB this time. I think I had every doctor in the whole fucking world look at my hoo-hoo and decide, you know, oh wow, she's pregnant, yeah. So that time it was Rashid, and he said, well, let me break your water. And I'm like, okay. So he says, it's not, it didn't break. So, and I think he asked me if I if I had any fluid come out. I said, well, I don't think so. I said, I peed, and it sounded different. And he said, maybe that was your water breaking. And I was like, mm, I don't know. So then he said, maybe you got to go to the hospital, Tara. So we get to the hospital after David hits every pothole on the freaking road, and they tell me to walk around some more. So I'm walking around, and I think, I don't think I can walk around anymore two days of labor. And then they hooked me up to this, uh, whatever, um, spinal pain thing. And I can't feel anything anymore. I can't tell when I'm having a contraction. They're telling me to push. I'm going, I can't feel anything. How am I supposed to push? So my got stuck. They had to do a C-section, emergency section. And I see him for like a second. So you see it right here. I'm like, I can't see that close to my face. Could you back him away, please? And he backed him away, and then he whisked him off to the NICU because he breathed in his poopies, his marconia, marconia, whatever it's called. 
So I don't even get to see the guy for another week, I think. I keep asking him, can I go see him? Can you tell me how he is? What's going on? No one. No one helped. So then we got to see him. He had his little circumcision. And he screamed blade murder. And then starts the... Uh, who's Michael? Is this one? And Betsy is, Anki, Anki, you can't breastfeed Tanner. That's disgusting. That's disgusting, Tanner. Anki, Anki. So, okay, and then we moved to Caliber Lake Apartments for two years, I think, with David and Michael. Amy Kovic was Michael's, like, nanny. I told her, well, she was, she worked at Toko Hills with Eli, her husband that she married. And she had a baby, like, within a week or two of Michael, so I figured she would watch, she wouldn't abuse my kid because she had a little baby, too. And I told her, well, I mean, I just offered it to her. I said, well, you know, if they said they were having problems making ends meet, and I said, well, you know, if... Uh, if you want, I have to pay for daycare anywhere. I, I can pay the same amount I want to pay daycare. And she said, okay. Except towards the end there, she wanted to take Michael to her apartment. And I was like, I don't know how it ended, but I just ended up putting him in daycare. Okay. Uh, she asked if she could use the formula. I said, sure, just let me know if you need you know, extra formula and I can buy some more. I don't want to run out. you got to keep the babies fed. And she asked if she could ask him to see whatever you want to. You want me to buy you something? I'll buy you something. But I don't think she ever said anything. David always bought the groceries, so whatever. So from Caliber, uh, the Caliber Lake Apartments in Smyrna, we moved to uh, the Falcon Crest house. Hawk Trace Court. Matt, uh, Michael, David, and me. And then Madison was born in 09. We got Maggie from Michael because he was getting older and he needed a little doggy to take care of. A little responsibility for the guy. Only David wouldn't let him do anything. I really hate David. <coughs> So, yeah, and then Spooky's around there somewhere. David had a black cat named Spooky. Male cat sprayed on my leather jacket. Mm. David just opened the door one day and never came back. And I'm like, I don't think you should let him outside. He's not an outside cat. So from there we go to the... 